And so it's a, a month long of, of festivities. I begin with the Birchas Kohanim, Vayadaber de Neyel Moishal Emer, Daber Lam Rabbana Bleyma, Kesav Oruchos Bnei Yisrael, Amor Lahem, Yivarechecha Adinoi V'yishmerecha, Yoer Adinoi Pana V'ylecha V'chuneko, Yisa Adinoi Pana V'ylecha V'yosem Lecha Shalom, V'somo Yishemiah Bnei Yisrael V'ani Avorachem. It's interesting, the Torah talks about the seven days of the holiday of Sukkot. Well, seven days of the holiday of Sukkot would be finished complete tomorrow. But then the Torah goes ahead and talks about by Yom Hashmini on the eighth day, Atzeres Tiolachem, and that God asked for there to be an extension, an addition to the seven days of the holiday of Sukkot with an eighth day. What is this eighth day all about? Is it Sukkot? Is it not Sukkot? What is the connection of this eighth day? And Rashi, the classic commentator, gives one of the most beautiful answers I've ever heard in understanding the importance of this holiday and why indeed this last day of all of these holidays can perhaps be looked at as the most important of them all. What does Rashi say the meaning of this day is? That God says to us, Kosha alai pridaschem. God says to the Jewish people, we have been together now for a month. We've gotten to know one another. We've gotten close to one another. We have formed a wonderful relationship. Parting is too difficult for me. Just saying goodbye is is just too hard. So why don't we spend a day, another day of the holiday, just to extend the honeymoon an extra day? There's a beauty to that in which God is actually telling us that he misses this relationship when we go our separate ways. And so he wants us to keep the spirit of the holidays and try to keep it going, this extra day which will hopefully give some energy and some strength that this relationship continues throughout the entire year. So how do we celebrate this relationship? How do we celebrate this extended honeymoon? What is the holiday? dancing with the Torah. The holiday of Shmini Atzeret and Simcha Torah is a holiday of joy. It's the Torah that serves as that constant reminder of who we are, of what we are, and why we are. You know, we hear and we speak a lot about Jewish unity, but when you think about it, what is the common denominator amongst the Jewish people? What is it that unifies the Jewish people? After all, we have many different languages, different cultures, different nationalities amongst us. What is it that binds us together in an enduring way? At the end of the day, my friends, we have only a single nucleus. The only thing that truly bonds us to one another is our Torah and its mitzvot. Nothing else has proven capable of holding us together for more than a generation or two at best. This is what first forged us as a nation, and this is the only common thread that has linked one generation to the next throughout the millennia ever since. And the more we tune into it, the more we understand it, the more we incorporate its teachings and guidance into our lives, the more we will appreciate the absolute joys of Judaism, the joys of life, that God has gifted to us. And I mentioned this a few weeks ago about speaking to a connoisseur of fine wine. It's, it's a fascinating thing because when you speak to someone that really likes wine and you ask them about a particular wine, you hear these words about it's ripe and it's rich and it's round and it's got this flavor and this flavor. And then if you really go to the, to the real experts about a certain wine, the ones that make the wines, and you ask them, and if you read this on, on some of the bottles of wine, if you read the descriptions on it, I, I, I took the quote off one of them. It's a discreet bouquet, elegant of soft tannins. It's perhaps reminiscent of raspberries or almonds. The taste is predominantly cherry with berry elements and a hint of plum. It goes perfectly with lighter meats such as goose and duck, but it goes superbly with Italian dishes. I have no idea what I just said. I, I, I don't begin to understand how you can taste something and tell me that you pick up something that's close to almonds and it's got berries and it tastes good with goose. 
Ichva Shnei Gornisht. I know Kedem grape juice. I taste it, it's sweet, it tastes good, I'm happy. But I am sure that those wine connoisseurs, they know exactly what it means, and they know what they're talking about. And the thing about those world-class experts is, is they, they study the wine, and the more they study it, the more they enjoy it. I'm, I'm you know, you're not supposed to be jealous, but I'm jealous of seeing someone enjoy the fine wines, because I don't have that palate. But you see them, and they're swishing it around, and they're looking at it, and ah, I'm a chaya huh, for them. Because the more they understand the complexities of the product, the more pleasure they're able to derive from it. And the same is true with anything that has depth and complexity. The more you understand it, the more you appreciate it, the more you understand the mysterious joy that it has to offer. You know, if your grandmother has cataract surgery, it's a miracle. She can see again and she's thrilled and everyone around her is happy. But the surgeon who delicately adjusted every tiny fiber and nerve ending in restoring grandma's sight, he or she appreciates that accomplishment on a totally different level. My friends, the Torah is not just an ancient document that has been handed down from one generation to another generation. It's not just a scroll we put in an ark. It's not just a scroll that belongs in a museum. The Torah is the manifestation of divine wisdom. There are the simple and direct meanings, the the allegorical meanings, the symbolic meanings, the homiletic teachings, esoteric and mystical teachings, each offering infinite levels and layers, each offering a spiritual pleasure delight of its own. Indeed, the same Torah that speaks to a five-year-old child on one level can speak to a 70-year-old scholar on another. So when you study the five books of Moses, or the books of the prophets, or the Talmud, you realize that these are not just stories of historical figures. You come to realize that this is your story, that this is the drama of your life. And every chapter, whether you're learning about Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, or Abraham and Sarah in Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia, or Joseph in Egypt, or our ancestors in the desert, or the emotional struggles of King David, or the passion of King Solomon, it comes alive. It says something compelling, something profound, and above all, something that's relevant to you. If you take the time to discover this treasure at whatever level or pace that works for you, you will find yourself savoring what it means to be a Jew with a whole new level of appreciation and sophistication. And so I want to urge everyone listening to this talk to take upon yourself a resolution to become a more literate Jew, to study, to learn, to read, to research, to take courses, to make it part of your daily and weekly life. You know, we're all familiar with the Nobel Prize between 1901 and 2014, just in that period of time. 850 laureates have been awarded the coveted prize. Of the 850, 185 were awarded to Jews. That's 22% of all Nobel Prize recipients, and that's a very nice percentage. But it's even more shocking when you figure that we only make up 0.02% of the world population. 0.02%. Based on that percentage, a Jew should win the Nobel Prize once every 30 years. That would be equal to the statistics. Do you know that 36% of all those that have won prizes from the United States were Jewish? 36% of all awards from our country were Jewish, and yet we make up only 2% of the United States population. Now, it's glaring that we have to ask the question, why is this? And I don't subscribe to the theory that it's part of our DNA. I believe rather that it is because from the very beginning of us becoming a people, 
education and study have always been priority number one. There's a reason they call us the people of the book. So now that we have become the world experts in every field of education, it's time to go back to the origins of our commitment to study. Torah literacy, Talmud literacy, ethics, Kabbalah. This is who we are. This is what defines us. This is what unites us. You know, back in 1991, I began teaching a weekly class on the five books of Moses. It started with two people in my office. And we started from Genesis. And we've been meeting regularly on Wednesday afternoons at 12.30 p.m. ever since. The class kind of grew. It took on a, a world of its own, so to say. And it's been going on since 1991. We are now in the book of Deuteronomy, the last of the five books. It's almost 30 years, 30 years, and we didn't finish the fifth book yet. And it's been the greatest journey of my life because we were there. We were there when Adam and Eve met a serpent. We were there when Noah built an ark. We were there when Abraham thought he would have to sacrifice his son. We were there when Jacob wrestled with the angel of Asab. We were there when Joseph was sold as a slave. We were there when Moses confronted Pharaoh. We were there when the sea split. We were at Mount Sinai. We worshiped the golden calf. No, maybe we didn't. Hope we didn't. We were there when Moses hit the rock. I can go on and on, and each and every story and verse talks to us today. We're not studying ancient history. We're not studying something that took place thousands of years ago. We're studying a book that talks to us today. It has guided us. It has changed us. It has enlightened us. It has inspired us. And over the years, we have had over a thousand students that have participated on this journey with me. And now over the past few months, since we've gone Zoom, the classes have now been viewed by thousands more. I take this opportunity to invite all of you to join. Let's join together Wednesday afternoons at 1230, as we take the final trek in the wilderness, as Moses prepares us to enter the Holy Land, be there with me. Be there with our ancestors. Be there with Moses. Be there with God. Let's be a literate Jew this year. And starting on, on Monday, October 19th at 7.30 p.m., we're going to be studying biblical reflections. It's a course that I'll be giving for through the fall semester, the winter semester. It's about finding yourself in the stories of the book of Genesis. We're going to take an in-depth look at some of the stories you may have glanced at in Hebrew school or read in the weekly Torah portion. But have you ever truly studied the story to know why is God telling you this story? Where am I in this story? Because I guarantee you, you're there. You're part of the story. And together we will try to find ourselves, a modern Jew living in the year 2020 in a story told to us thousands of years ago. As one wise man put it, the study of Torah is not education. It's transformation. It transforms you as a person and as a Jew because you're developing a deeper understanding of what it means to be a human being, the crown jewel of God's creation, and what it means to be a Jew, a member of God's chosen people. As Jews, we are obligated to serve God with joy. This is what Simcha Torah is all about. The Torah and its mitzvot can be vehicles for tremendous joy and satisfaction in our lives. The joy is magnified by our appreciation for the depth of what it's really all about at its deepest and most essential level. We don't just go through the motions of reciting the prayers and observing the rituals and traditions. We develop an understanding of its deeper meaning, of its complexities, 
and experiencing the truest joy and the truest flavor of what it means to be a Jew. So let's be literate Jews. Let's get involved in our studies this year. Let's take it one more level because there is so much available to you wherever you are in the world, wherever it is that you're listening to my voice. I know we have people from Poland and people from Denmark and people from all over the world that have been emailing me that you're joining together and studying the Torah together with us. Well, let's spread the word. Back in the old country, there was a poor Jew named Moishala who would go every month to the local parrots, parrots, to the land baron to pay his rent. And during one such visit to the parrots, the landlord, he noticed that the, the duke had a plate in front of him upon which was sitting the most exquisite looking mushroom omelet. But even more tantalizing was the way it looked and the aroma that was coming forth from that plate. And the way the porridge was getting into it, Moshe could feel his mouth watering as he watched the porridge dig into the omelet with the knife and the fork, and he chewed it down with such gusto. Mm. Walking home, Paul Moshe resigned himself to the fact that, hey, it's just not my mazel. I'm not a porridge. I'm never going to be a porridge. I'm poor Moshe. I will never enjoy a mushroom omelet. But then as he's walking, he thinks to himself, you know what? Maybe I'm no parrots out there. But in my house, I'm the parrots of my house. I'm the landlord of my own house. So sure enough, he comes home all excited. And he says to his sweet wife, Esther, I would like very much if you could make me a mushroom omelet, just like the parrots in town gets to enjoy. What do you say? His wife, Esther, was such a sweet woman, and she says, Moishala, to make you a mushroom omelet would be the greatest joy of my life. But we have a problem. You see, to make a mushroom omelet, you need mushrooms. And we don't have any mushrooms, nor can we afford to buy any mushrooms. Ah, Moishala says, come on, you're a good cook. Substitute. Use something else instead. Substitute, but I want a mushroom omelet. Esther says, sure, sure. But to make a mushroom omelet, you also need some butter or some oil. We don't have any, and I can't, we can't afford it. Substitute, be creative. Okay, okay. But to make a proper mushroom omelet, my dear Maishala, you need a little starch to fluff it up a bit. Ah, starch, come on, fluff it, schmuff it. Do something, you can make it, figure it out. Maishala, one more thing. To make a mushroom omelet, you need eggs. You need eggs, and we don't have any eggs, and we don't have any money to buy any eggs. Esther, oh my dear, be spontaneous. You don't have to stick to the exact recipe to make a good mushroom omelet. Substitute the eggs with something else. Come on. Esther is a sweet woman, and she really loves Moishala. And so she goes to the kitchen, and she puts together whatever she possibly can and she puts it on a plate in front of Moishala, who's all excited and he can't wait to be the pirates in his own home. And he tucks his napkin under his shirt, shirt just like he saw the pirates did. He looks at the plate, doesn't look exactly the same, but no, it's a mushroom omelet. He takes his knife, he takes his fork, he slices off a piece, takes a bite of it and spits it out. And he says, oh, this is awful. I can't understand what the parrots likes about mushroom omelets. It's a cute story. I tell it so often. It talks to us. Because when it comes to presenting Judaism today to young people, whether young in years or young in terms of Torah knowledge, if you remove all of the authentic ingredients of what makes Judaism what it is. If you take out the scholarship, if you take out the depth, if you take out the meaning, if you take out the substance, if you take out the Torah, if you take the Torah out of Yiddishkeit and you substitute all of that with different elements and different ingredients, you can call it from today to tomorrow a mushroom omelet. Is it really any wonder when those young people taste it and they just spit it out? 
and the reaction is, I don't understand why my Bobby and Zaidi risk their lives for Judaism. I don't see what people see in Judaism. That's the greatest tragedy of all. The greatest tragedy is that these kids are abandoning Judaism and they have no idea what it is that they're abandoning. So let's show them. Let's be role models. Let's make a real, true mushroom omelet with all the ingredients and you will see them eat it up and ask for more because they will find that Yiddishkeit, that Judaism is not a burden. It's not an imposition. It's not a sacrifice. It is in fact a gift. It is a blessing and it's a privilege. You know, it's an interesting phenomenon. When you get, you get flowers from a florist or your husband buys you a bouquet of flowers and they're beautiful, but they, they don't last very long. They have a few days and they start to wilt. And you try putting in those little aspirins that come along with it, the flower medicine, but they still, they don't last too long. Now the very same flower, if it was still attached to its roots, if the rose was still part of the rose bush, it, it lasts a little bit longer because it's attached to its roots. But even flowers that are attached to their roots doesn't necessarily guarantee long-term survival because if you were to plant the golden poppy of California and you planted it in Brooklyn, and even if you watered it and you fertilized it and you did everything that Martha Stewart tells you to do, they may grow, but they're not gonna last that much longer than the cut flowers that your husband buys you for Shabbos or Yantif. They're not gonna last that long. And even if they did, they don't take off, they won't spread. But you take the same seeds and you plant them in Southern California or in Hawaii in a more natural environment, then they grow, then they spread, then they flourish. Why am I talking to you about cut flowers? For a good few decades, Judaism in America looked like it was going down the path of the cut, cut flower phenomena. No roots, cut off from its past no traditions to hold dear and sacred, a Jew for a few days a year. This was the land of the free, all right, but many of our parents and grandparents utilized the free to be free from Torah, free from Shabbat, free from kosher, free from mikvah, free from Hebrew school teachers that spoke little English and couldn't relate to the American youth. And assimilation was rampant. There was a famous Harvard study that predicted when the last Jew would pass away in America. And cults and maharishis and missionaries were preying on Jewish souls. Intermarriage reached an all-time high of 52%. Historians and statisticians will tell you that in order for any ethnic group to survive, you must have a minimal birth rate of 2.1 per family. And the American Jewish family was at 1.4. You see what the statisticians of the Harvard study knew, and they knew correctly, was that without the pressure of the shtetl life, without the anti-Semitism that forced the Jews to stick together, without the authority of the rabbi, without Jewish practice as part of day-to-day -day life, Judaism in America did not stand a chance. We were a bunch of cut flowers waiting to wilt away. And if we had best sprinkled the tradition here and the latke there and the piece of gefilte fish and we went to see Fiddler on the Roof, these roots were like planting seeds in an unnatural environment. We were bound to fail. As one report said, Kaddish time, the mourner's Kaddish is soon coming for the American Jew. My friends, we shouldn't be here. Th this shouldn't be happening. We're fortunate and we're blessed to be on the front row of the greatest renaissance of Judaism in our history. Not because of a supernatural miracle, not because we heard God's voice at Mount Sinai, not because we walked through the Sea of Reeds, not even because the Iron Curtain came down. There is a renaissance of Judaism throughout our country because of a true, honest yearning of a free people 
to search for godliness, to search for goodness, to search for tradition, to search for their own heritage, for no ulterior motive other than I'm Jewish, this is my place, this is my home, this is my tradition, this is my, mit, my Torah, and these are my mitzvot. In the early 1940s, in Poland, a boy in his late teens, blessed with remarkable gifts for Torah scholarship, was studying in the yeshiva many miles from home. In fact, the yeshiva dormitory had become his home. It had been a long time since this young man had seen his parents. And one day, one fateful and unforgettable day, the dreaded, terrifying cry pierced through the very holes of the yeshiva. Run for your lives. The Nazis have crossed the border. The boy ran to the train station. The line of people waiting to purchase tickets was already stretching for endless blocks and blocks. He held his place on line for literally several days in a row, hoping for a ticket home to be with his parents during those darkest hours of our history. Slowly, the line inched closer to the station. The days of waiting would soon come to an end. Hours passed. The ticket window was now clearly in sight. And then there were but a few people between himself and the front of the line. He got his money ready to pay for his ticket. And suddenly a flurry of activity. The window was closed. Barricades were moved into place. No more tickets, no more trains, no more lines. The boy collapsed in tears of devastation and disappointment. He wept for day on, having come so close to a ride home, only to have it snatched away before his very eyes. Why, he cried, why? It was months later that he discovered that had he boarded that train, it would have been the final journey of his life. Dear friends, the boy in this story was my father of blessed memory. And all my life I lived with one very simple truth. I could have very easily not been. He just happened to be a few people behind in a line. And I, and my children, and my grandchildren would never have lived these lives. So why me? I don't have answers. None of us do. But the one thing we must all know is that if we are here, we're here for a reason. And it's not to assimilate out of existence. Rather, I believe it is so that we this generation, the generation of the children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren of survivors, this post-Holocaust ge generation would create and bring about this great Jewish resurgence and the fulfillment of our mission in the history of our world. So I invite you to join the Renaissance and I invite you to invite others to join this Renaissance. There's so many opportunities to learn. After I conclude with my final story, go on jewishacademy.com. Do it tonight. Don't push off a good resolution for a day or two or a week because then something comes in the way and you forget. Do it tonight. Go on jewishacademy.com and there's 20 different possible courses and there's another 20 lectures that you can participate in. Go to torahcafe.com. Visit the JLI website. There's so much learning available for you in your own homes. Corona safe. Socially distant, but very much together. Very much united. There's so much learning available to you. Let's become more literate Jews. My closing story, especially in honor of this holiday of Simchat Torah. Gideon Katz, or Gidi as he is known, was one of the most respected jet fighter pilots in the Israeli Air Force. 
He was admired for his sharp mind, for his light and quick instincts by older and younger pilots alike. He was what in Israel was the top gun of Israel. His personality sort of matched his military record in that he always kept his emotions in check. He always maintained an even keel, knowing that his next mission, whenever it would come to pass, would require focus and balance. From his teen years, Giddy Katz always took strong interest in the events of the Holocaust. Although his grandmother, Safta Buria, was a survivor, she never spoke to him about her experiences, as many survivors did. They wouldn't talk about it. And still he knew, he knew that she had survived the concentration camps and it meant a lot to him that he was now using his efforts and his talents and his life skill to defend the Jewish people. One day, Giddy's commanding officer approached him with a tempting offer. The IDF was giving its top soldiers a chance to travel to Europe to see the concentration camps and to tour the places where some of the famous battles of World War II took place. And Giddy jumped at the opportunity. Even though he wasn't religious, his mother gave him a small book of Tehillim, a book of Psalms before he left. And she suggested, just keep it in your pocket, just in case you're ever going to be moved to recite a prayer. You'll have a prayer book with you. So Gideon, he took the book of Psalms, he took the Tehillim, though he didn't think likely that he would ever be moved to recite any other prayers. The Torah took the group of Israeli military men to the main concentration camps and their surrounding cities. And after touring some of the larger cities, they stopped off in a place called Stotov. Although not as well known as some of the larger camps, Stotov was a brutal camp with more than 85,000 Jews were murdered. And as, as the soldiers walked through the airy grounds of Stotov, Gidi took in the experience. He was, he was horrified by the abysmal living conditions and was surprised that so many Jews lost their lives in this small camp. I mean, over the years, he read about Auschwitz, he read about Treblinka, but he never even heard of Stadov. 85,000 Jews killed in this small camp. He tried to imagine what life must have been like for the inmates never knowing if it was your last day on earth. As he passed the barracks, a building in the distance grabbed his attention. And as he approached it, he was shocked to discover that Stutthoff had his own gas chamber and crematorium. The tour guide told him that although the camp was originally built as a labor and prisoner of war camp, it eventually became part of the final solution, its sole purpose to murder and exterminate Jews. As soon as Giddy stepped into the gas chamber, he felt like he was about to suffocate. And immediately in his mind, he's imagining the tens of thousands who died in that room. But instead of feeling an impulse to cry or an impulse to take revenge, the strangest and most inappropriate feeling overcame him. He suddenly felt like he wanted to sing and dance. How could it be? He was Giddy Katz. He was the crack fighter pilot who was always in control of his emotions. And now he wants to sing. He's struggling to get his emotions back in check. And so he steps outside of the gas chamber. He reached into his pocket and he took out that small Tehillim that his mother had given him. He didn't know a lot of religious songs. He didn't know any prayers. In fact, he only knew one song, one Jewish song. And it wasn't even part of the book of Tehillim. It wasn't part of Psalms. The only time that he would go to the Beit HaKnesset, the only time he would go to the synagogue, was on Simcha Torah. And he remembers people dancing with the Torah, and they would sing over and over again this song. Sisu b'simcho b'simcha Torah Utnu kavod la Torah, which translates rejoice and exult in the joy of Torah. That's the song he remembered as a kid. He's standing outside a gas chamber and he begins to sing 
Sisu bisimcho bisimcha Torah, utsnu kavod la Torah. Now he doesn't have a Torah to hold, so he holds up this little Tehillim that his mother gave him. Picture this, and he's dancing outside of a gas chamber, this non-religious Israeli Jew, holding this little Tehillim, singing on the top of his lungs, the song of Sisu bisimcho bisimcha Torah. It was so strange. It was so weird. He had no idea where this compulsion was coming from. And at the same time, he couldn't stop himself from singing and dancing. Sisu v'simcho v'simcha Torah Usnu kavod la Torah Right in the middle of the singing and dancing, his phone rings. He picks it up. It's his mother. Ima, he said, you won't believe what's going on. I'm in a place called Stotov, and I'm having the strangest feeling, the strangest reaction. As soon as Gidi said the word Stotov, his mother interrupts him and says, you must call your grandmother, Buria, now. Call her right now. Gidi didn't even have a chance to ask why. She just said, call her right now. So he calls his grandmother, Safta, it's Gidi. His grandmother was thrilled to hear her grandson's voice, was curious as to why he was calling. He didn't uh, talk, didn't call too often. So he told his grandmother, I called my, I spoke to my mother, she called me. I told her I'm at a place called Statov, and she said, I need to call you. And before he could continue, his Safta stopped him. I know all about Statov. I was there. I was in Statov with my whole family. And then there was complete silence. No one said a word. And finally, after a minute or so, Gidi continued. I walked around the camp and I saw the barracks. And the tour guide described the horrific conditions in which you lived. But when I walked into the gas chambers, the oddest feeling came over me. I felt like I needed to sing and dance. And I know you must think that this is totally bizarre, but I stepped outside the gas chambers where I'm talking to you from right now, and I began dancing here right next to the crematorium. Ima gave me a small tehillim to carry with me, and I'm dancing with that tehillim like Jews dance with the Torah and Simchat Torah. At that point, Gidi can hear the sounds of sobbing on the other end realizing how emotional it must have been for his grandmother to hear her grandson describing the concentration camps in which she had been interred, he apologized for upsetting her. But nothing prepared him for what he was about to hear next. No, Gidi Saftaburia said, I'm happy you're there. I'm happy you're able to see what I lived through. So many lives were sacrificed there. And then she shared this. I was only 10 years old when I was taken to Stathof. Safta, Yuri is telling her grandson. I knew that my father, Gideon, from whom you are named, your great-grandfather, I knew he had a job in the camp, but I didn't know what it was. Later I found out that he was one of the Sander commandos those were the prisoners forced to remove the dead bodies from the gas chambers and bring them to the crematorium. One night, after a full day of this horrific work, my father stepped outside with the others in his group. And when the German officer, the Nazi Yemach Shemay, stepped away for a cigarette break, my father spoke to the others. And he said, these Nazis have taken away our sense of humanity. We have been transformed into animals. But today is Simcha Torah. Even if it is difficult, let us dance and sing and remember that we're not animals. We are Yidden, we are Jews, we are children of the Almighty. And so they stood 
right outside the gas chambers, right next to the crematorium. My father removed one torn page of a siddur that he had saved in his pocket, and they danced that night on Simchat Torah, my father, your great-grandfather, holding this one page in his hand, and he sang, Sisu v'simchu b'simchat Torah, usnu kavod Torah. Rejoice and exult in the joy of the Torah. At that point, Macho Gidi, the man who never let his emotions get the better of him, felt tears streaming down his cheeks. Because somehow, the song of his great-grandfather, who sung the song 60 years before at that exact spot, found its way into his soul. He couldn't help but be inspired by this awesome, heart-stopping experience, and thus began his spiritual journey to find his own way to Torah and Jewish observance. Ladies and gentlemen, we are not a broken people. For all we have been through, we have not responded with revenge and with hate. No, we have built families. We have built communities. We have revived our land. We have brought goodness into the world, wherever we may have found ourselves. What greater victory against Hitler and the enemies of the Jewish people can there possibly be than for us to live as proud, strong, literate, knowledgeable, and connected Jews. We are all survivors. Every one of us, children are survivors, grandchildren are survivors, great-grandchildren are survivors, whether our parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents were there or not. We, the entire Jewish generation, we are all survivors. We are all the continuation of the greatest story in the history of mankind. And every day, we along with our families have the opportunity to plant seeds, to celebrate our Torah, to celebrate our heritage. And that is what we must do with courage, with pride, with strength, and with tremendous joy. So let's celebrate this Simchat Torah. Let's dance, the dance of the Jew on Simchat Torah. Whether you do so at home, whether you do so at services, wherever it is that you may live, find your local Chabad and find out what type of programs are going off of Simchat Torah. Or even if you're staying in your home, dance a little bit, dance a lot to Simchat Torah. And then spend the year immersed in the study and the pursuit of the knowledge of Torah. Chag Sameach to all.